Hello Internet, Taliesin here and welcome to another episode of the Weekly Reset, Taliesin and Evertel's Wondrous Wisdom Show in a week where, oh hang on a second, I have mail. Oh, it's from Thermitage Vachine. I wonder what it is. Oh, it's a single vibrant shard and a single piece of wildercloth. Uh... Thanks, that's lovely. In a week where patch 10.1 Embers of Neltharion released and in a week where season two is about to start in a few hours time. As I record this, the new raid will be live and we will have seen the ending of the raid, which should give us an idea of what is going to happen next. And you know, I always love to know what's happening next. As the 10.1.5 PTR, which is already loaded up in the data, gets ready to go and show us what the mega dungeon will be all about. I'm currently thinking it will be a time travel dungeon where we go back to important parts of the aspect's history. So there'll be a Cataclysm bit, a War of the Ancients bit with loads of Legion stuff going on, that'll be cool. Finishing up at the very beginning of their story with a big fight against Galakrond. To be clear, that prediction is based on basically no evidence or very little evidence and is very much a gut feeling, but that's what I'm putting out there. And that's before we even consider the race for world first in Aberus, both the pretend ones for guilds whose names are nothing like Immortalis and the real ones for guilds with names that are a bit like Immortalis. Can the brave, handsome people's champions Immortalis Argent Dawn EU improve on their third place Vault of the Incarnates showing? Well, you'll just have to watch this show for like the next three months to find out, won't you? But today is all about 10.1, or should I say, the patch that went wrong. Because it kind of did, didn't it? In fact, to help us get a handle on everything that went wrong with Launch of Embers, please welcome the T&E Wheel of Shit! I mean, news, news, the Wheel of News. Shall we give it a spin and see? Yeah, even before the patch went live on Tuesday, Monday saw things already starting to go to shit on the trading post, where a number of items that had featured in Blizzard's May preview over the weekend were missing, replaced instead by a new, completely unseen Mediv three-piece set with a feathery hood and a feathery staff and cape. Although when they were snapped up by eager early bird EU visitors to the post, they appeared in game as placeholder checked boxes. Because of course, this this wasn't a sneaky surprise from Blizz to keep us on our toes and reward us for being awesome. It was an absolute cock up. Someone in an office somewhere pressing the put on trading post button when they should have pressed the put on cash shop button, which is where this set did appear the next day for eight United States dollary dues. And interestingly, for the first time ever, a disclaimer that the set would also be appearing on the trading post towards the end of the year. A move that saw many players legitimately praise Blizzard for their transfer transparency, if not their correct button pressing. And I don't really want to linger on this, okay? Because this video is about the patch and that's what I want to talk about, but it's playing on my mind and I feel I should mention it. As you know, I'm a big fan of the trading post. I think it's an awesome idea with the strict caveat that traders tender are never sold on the cash shop. And having a transmog set on the cash shop with the promise that it will be on the trading post later, it's not literally selling traders tender for cash, but fun Functionally, it is. Most people, when they buy this, yes, they're going to get it six months earlier than they would if they waited for it to appear in-game, but an intrinsic part of this transaction, in my opinion, is that if you buy this now, you know you will be saving a significant amount of tenders down the line to spend on something else. People who pay cash for this will have more tenders to spend towards the end of the year than people who don't, and that is basically buying tenders on the store, which I thought we all agreed was bad, and like, the line. And you may disagree. You may think this is nothing like buying tenders for cash and that the tenders you will definitely save down the line isn't actually on anyone's minds when they put their card details into the site. But in that case, I would ask you to answer my next question carefully. If Blizzard said that this set would appear as the Traveler's Log reward at the end of the year, as in the free reward that you don't spend tenders on, would you be more or less tempted to buy it now? Do you think more or less people overall would be interested in buying it now? I think it's pretty obvious that as a shop item, it would be way less desirable in that case. And as such, the extra tenders is absolutely 
absolutely a part of this transaction in most buyers' minds. And Blizzard know that. It's not the biggest deal, but I do think it's worth noticing, and it does make me like the trading post a little bit less, I have to be honest. Oh, sorry, what a shitty way to start the episode. I do actually really like patch 10.1, so let's actually talk about 10.1 and spin the wheel again. <laughs> The story campaign of the patch sees our players bury poor Centaur Scout Ash, um, sorry, Shaquille, who died in the Firak Shack attack, descend into the Busted Mountain, fight their way through the Zaralek Caverns after being rescued by the Niffin Mole people, and then rescuing Rathian and Sibelian, investigating an old Titan facility with Emberthal and Abyssian, where they encounter a seemingly now hopelessly corrupted Sarkarath and destroy the Oathbreaker Mind Control Gauntlet, before encountering Firak having a big old Shadow Flame bath, healing Sibelian after he takes a full Shadow Blame breath hit to the face so he can help you steal a comically large Jaradin dragon slaying spear and attempt to slay Firak with it, which absolutely doesn't work at all and actually Abyssian gets skewered on a comically large dragon slaying spear instead, but then he survives because Sibelian zaps it with some fire, at which point honestly I'm starting to wonder if the dragon slaying properties of these massive dragon slaying spears might have been slightly exaggerated. And then rescuing most of the Niffin when their village is turned into a big old shadow flame fireball by Firak as he riots out again. All of that and we haven't even touched on chapter five yet, which, uh, um, uh, hang on. What happened to chapter five? Oh, right, yeah, chapter five isn't starting. Is that, uh, is that supposed to happen? I mean, not happen? What's going on here? Someone tell me what to do. Maybe game tell me what to do? Too much to ask? Okay, day one bugs I get, but three whole chapters missing? Come on. Yes, as revealed in our interview with Steve Denuza the day after the reveal of Embers of Neltharion, the campaign storyline is in fact time-gated, or just, you know, episodic would be a better description probably which means that the scouring of Noseshire was the last act of the first instalment. Which is probably why that chapter ends with the three Black Dragon Amigos at the top of the Tower of the Aspects, literally saying, oh, well, I'm pooped. We need to regroup and take a bit of time, like maybe a week, to formulate a new plan. Come back later in like maybe a week, and maybe we'll have some news for you next week. But if the quest text signaled pretty clearly what was going on, Blizzard didn't. Sparking rumours across the forum that it was a launch day bug that was making Chapter 5 inaccessible. And why not? There were plenty of those. Add it to the list. The Great Vault was gaily awarding players item level 50 loot for some f***. Reason the range on player nameplate said inexplicably changed for lots of people during the reset, meaning that they wouldn't appear unless you were right on top of other players or mobs without manually setting the range distance again with a console command. Thermitorge Vashin sent every single one of my characters a single vibrant shard and a single piece of wildercloth in the mail, like the world's skintest stalker. Who's to say this wasn't just another one of those? So naturally, someone wrote a bug report about chapter five not starting and got a response saying Blizz were looking into the problem. Okay, it was an automated response, but you can see why people were quick to take this as proof that the game was just broken and then actually chapter five was just a quick hot fix away. A hope that was eventually quashed by a blue post which solved all confusion by clarifying beyond doubt that no, actually chapters four and five of the campaign would be unlocked next week. Except, yeah, no Blizz, because we'd already done Chapter 4, that is already unlocked. Did you mean Chapter 5 and 6, Blizz? Do you want to clarify the clarification, Blizz, since it makes literally no f sense? It's not a big deal, we kind of all knew what they meant, kind of. And you may well be sitting there, now, with the benefit of hindsight, wondering how anyone was confused about this, because yes, of course Chapter 4's ending is very obviously the end of the campaign questing for the week. But the truth is, I've buried the lead a bit here, because the main evidence that Chapter 5 conspiracy theorists had was that Chapter 5 is where we get our new winding Slitherdrake dragon riding mounts. <laughs> oh yes! Spin the wheel. The Slither Drake, the new fifth dragon riding mount of Dragonflight, but apparently from some sneaky data mining this week, not the last dragon riding mount of the expansion. The Grove Nether Drake being marked as a trading post item in the data, although as we've been learning recently, that does not mean that's where it's guaranteed to appear. But yeah, the Slither Drake, which when I first saw it, I was like, oh wow, what an ugly piece of shit. That definitely won't be replacing my beautiful, exquisitely customized Bowser Boy, but which actually 
actually is surprisingly fun and satisfying to fly in the caverns. Something you'll just have to take my word for now because, like I say, you won't be getting your hands on it until Chapter 5, Week 2. Which is weird because Blizzard definitely said that we were getting it in Week 1. Like... Definitely. It is the very first thing on the splash screen. The week one splash screen, not the week two splash screen, which will tell us about season two starting. And on the roadmap that Blizz put out, charting the release schedule of 10.1 stuff, it does very clearly show the Slither Drake as being something that arrives on May the 2nd. So honestly, yeah, you can see why people thought that chapter five of the campaign, with all its Slither Drake riding goodness, must have been part of the week one roster of quests. And that is perfectly fair. That is very reasonable and it was a shit show obviously. Scummy move. Love the false advertisement from the side of Blizzard. Blizz always find a way to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. I thought they mostly stopped this time gating shit. Clearly not. Yeah I don't think there's anything underhand going on here really. It was just dumb. Personally, I'm okay with the chapters being separated out into different weeks. Chapter 7 has to be anyway because it's set after the raid and I think two hours of questing is about right for an opening week. Of main story that is, which I thought was really good with dramatic cutscenes and some incredible voice acting and all taking place in a zone, which I have to say like, how does the cavern look this good? I mean, it's a cave, right? But there were times during that questing, especially in the areas that were bathed in purple and orange hues, where I was genuinely taken aback by just how good looking Zaralek is. So fair play. And then there's like another 45 to an hour's worth of quests with the Dragons and Scale Expedition, which is possibly the best quest of the expansion so far. So overall, yeah, I was pretty happy and glad that there are another three chapters still to come, leaving me to get on with world quests and rare hunting and wondering what I'm going to commission some lucky crafter to make for me using my brand new Spark of Shadow Flame that I got from those opening quests. Ah, anyway, let's spin the wheel again, shall we? The Spark of Shadow Flame is gained from a quest which unlocks after chapter one of the campaign. And it's very important because you're only gonna get half of a spark every week from now on, meaning that my staff that I crafted with my own two hands on my main, Taliesin's Law, won't be upgraded to current levels for two more weeks because it needs two sparks to do it. It's a super valuable thing that you're going to want on all characters. And when the patch went live, the quest that gave you the spark, a worthy ally, Lone Niffin, was, like I say, only available to characters upon completing chapter one of the campaign. Bury Ash after the shack attack, fight your way through the cavern, rescue the Black Dragon Bros and make your way to Moss Eisley. As in, every character would have to complete the opening scenario to get their sparks every time. Which I think is fair, really, don't you? Well, don't take my word for it. Just ask the forums where everyone agreed that a reward as important as a spark of shadow flame should involve at least a tiny bit of effort. And completing one chapter out of four is hardly backbreaking effort, especially since... <laughs> no, it was a shit show, obviously. Here we go again. Same old blizz. What's the point anymore? How disrespectful to their customers. Lessons learned? Zero. Oof, and it wasn't even fun, IMO. This is so bad, Blizz never learns. Not only they underdeliver all the time, they also keep lying to their customers. But don't panic, guys. Dragonflight is objectively the most alt-friendly expansion ever. By a country mile, this was just a mistake. I know, how unlike the rest of this patch so far, I know. See, the thing is, as many people noticed, there is no campaign skip for the Zaralek Caverns so far, because there doesn't need to be one. Orcs can just fly underground and start all the grindy stuff straight away without bothering with those quests in the first place, which is great. But obviously, somewhere along the line, no one noticed that this would mean also skipping access to that all-important spark quest. So, one swift hotfix later, problem solved. Solved. Worthy Ally is now there waiting to be picked up regardless of your alts campaign progress. Which is good because there's only so many times I need to be told that Rathian smells really nice, you know? And it goes without saying, everyone was happy about that. What the fuck? I did this stupid boring campaign on six. Six alts plus my main. I hated my life. And now this, nearly everyone was happy. I mean, obviously I did the campaign all the way through on four separate characters anyway, because I just really wanted the outrageously much better than they have any any right to be black dragon questing sets in all four armor classes. And can confirm that even though I thought it was great, that was definitely enough campaign questing for me. Let's spin the wheel. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so you may have thought some of the things we've talked about already are complete dick ups on Blizzard's part, but I promise you that this is the biggest dick up of all. Like, joking aside, fam, because this is serious now, okay? You serious? You listening? Good. Because there is a new toy in 10.1. It's called the Shadow Flame Cinder Toy, and it covers your character in Shadow Flame effect, which you know I love. It is the toy I need this patch. Obviously, I have to have it. And the way you get the toy is pretty neat, too. There's a chest in the caverns in the middle of a pool of shadow flame, which means that to open it, you need to be wearing the Anixia Scale Cloak, a leatherworking craft from Vanilla Wow, which requires reagents from an Anoxia kill to make, which is really cute. I like that. And as you can imagine, sent prices of said cloak into overdrive on the auction house, selling for 60,000 gold on some servers on day one. I got mine for 16k, but I would have happily have paid anything, frankly, to get my sweet, sweet shadow flame look, which I did. Bargain. And okay, so the effect only lasts 10 minutes on a 15 minute cooldown, which is, yeah, annoying, but whatever. I can still spend two thirds of my time drenched in sexy shadow flame awesomeness, as long as I'm not in combat, because it turns out that, like a lot of appearance changing toys in Dragonflight, in fairness, the shadow flame cinder toy effect disappears if you enter combat. I repeat, it disappears when you enter combat. So it's basically only good for standing around in town and not actually for playing the game. And actually, no, that sucks. I don't think I've ever been more disappointed in my entire life. Luckily, the Aspirant sets in Season 2 all have really genuinely cool Shadow Flame effects on them, and pieces from these sets can be bought individually with honor. So you can at least get some of these Shadow Flame looks by essentially just doing your Cobalt Assembly PvP world quests when they pop up on different armor classes. And you know, maybe the toy thing is a bug. Anyway, I wrote a bug report to Blizz and got this automated response saying that they're looking into it. So I mean, all in all, I've had a really good time in the first week of 10.1. I thought the story was solid and dramatic and started the build up to the raid really well. The side quests were brilliant and overall, I just really liked the caverns much more than I expected. The sniff and seek mini game at its best is like a lost Viking style puzzler, which I absolutely adore. But it's also true that after a few days of clearing the map of quests and rares. I am definitely ready for season two to start in earnest with Firak Assaults and Mythic Plus and the raid and as excited as I am for all of that, in my mind there's just something missing from the patch and probably will be until we hear about the Mega Dungeon I think. Yeah I know season two is literally about to start and I'm already thinking about the 10.1.5 PTR. That's just the kind of thinking Dragonflight has got us into right now, it's wild. I'm sorry there's no Evie this week. The bank holiday weekend we just had in the UK was really hectic for us because because it meant childcare has been closed, but we will definitely get her on the sofa next week to give her thoughts on the patch and the end of the raid. If you want more Talies and Nevertel in the meantime, I recommend you check out our second channel. It's called Talies and Nevertel's second channel, and it features edits of conversations that we have about WoW news on our Twitch stream, and often covers stuff that we don't always get time to talk about on this main channel. So for example, in the last week, we had videos discussing the new data mind evoker only legendary and predictions for the next expansion. Links are in the description below with all the usual WoW Ahead articles that we think you'll find interesting in relation to today's topics. And thanks for joining us today. If you like this video, don't thank us. Thank our patrons who give their actual real life money to make all of our work happen. And guys, seriously, genuinely, thank you. Because without you, there would be a whole lot less Taliesin and Evertel. Hey, you know what? With BlizzCon news apparently imminent, I think it's time to get another weekly reset live sorted, don't you? If you didn't like it, downvote the shit out of it. Remember, my name is Paid Scavenger. No, my name is Taliesin from me and Evertel and everyone else too. Until next time, cheerio.